now move on to the panel session. And um, in fact, um, clearly we've got a, a very prestigious group here. And I'm pleased to say, I noted from Peter's slide that we have four of the five top 10 companies, top five um, companies quoted in that slide up here. So a great opportunity this morning. And, and I also sense, I, we'll see what our panel say, but for me at this IBC, I sense that um, there is a change of sentiment about IP and, and IT. I don't know if you would agree with me from the audience or the panel, but if you go back a few years, there was a lot of cynicism, there was a lot of pushing back. And I think um, this year it's much more pragmatic. It's happening. How do we make it work? Well, uh, let's see what our panel have to say about that. Um, so let me introduce the panel first. To my left is Steve Knepper. He's the general manager, global media and entertainment industry at IBM. Then John Dillon, who is the vice president of marketing at Akamai. Tony Emerson, managing director, worldwide media and cable at Microsoft. Lionel Lapras, he's the head of worldwide media and entertainment, communications and media solutions, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, with the longest title there, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Muriel De Latua, who is the managing director and CEO of EVS. And Charlie Vogt, uh, he's the CEO of Imagine Communications. Welcome, lady and gentlemen. Uh, let me start with you, Steve. And um, well, maybe I, I opened it up already by saying I, I feel there is a, a greater acceptance of the the way I, the role that IT is playing our in, in our industry. But perhaps you could expand upon um, how IT is playing a greater role in the broadcast workflow and, and the benefits. Yeah, well, I think the chart's pointed out some interesting things. The one that I kind of focused on was the R&D chart. One of the things we saw 10 years ago was, you know, IBM's going to spend $5 billion on R&D this year whether we sell anything in the media industry or not. So if we could determine how we could take those scale R&D efforts and put it into the media industry, there was going to be advantage for the marketplace. And in a market that's changing every day, I mean, after 20 years, I think the only thing I know for sure is that it's going to be different tomorrow. I think that puts incredible pressure on all of you as you're trying to put new services out to your customers. So in Workflow, as an example, we started many years ago building a, a, using ideas that came from IT like service-oriented architecture and enterprise services bus and abstraction and things like that in order to create a more efficient digital factory for media companies. And we've, we've basically been working on that now for about 10 years. What it does is it allows you to think of the kind of uh, functions, edit, package, ship, QC, et cetera, that happen in a, in a media workflow as services. And if you can abstract those from the infrastructure, from the hardware, you can run those services wherever they need to run. So if we think of what's happening in the real world now with things like cloud and analytics and, and a mobile first world that we live in where consumers are in control of their consumption experience, you have to have an increased level of agility in, in your architecture. So like in cloud, we spent a couple billion dollars and bought a company called SoftLayer, enterprise class cloud, global. Added another couple billion to build 40 data centers around the world. No charge for data on the way in, good for media files. No charge to move it around the world, good when you're trying to reach customers and markets all over the, the world. Um, the ability to turn the servers up and down as efficiently and as quickly as you need to. That kind of flexibility shows up, I think, in helping the ecosystem move forward quicker in the marketplace. So, Give you an example, SohoNet in the UK is running on that platform and it allows for the interchange of a lot of content and media services in the UK and also Europe. In analytics, the ability then to take that platform and to make it smart. I think of it as a smart media factory. Constantly making the best decision as these contention for resources in your, in your shop continue to grow. How do I do the next best thing at every single moment? And we can use analytics to do that. We can also use analytics to understand much more precisely what every consumer is doing while they're consuming in real time. That makes that platform a lot smarter. And then as I think about this mobile world where it's all about how do I get that right experience on the right device at the right time, once again, the ability to abstract some of that complexity so that your workflows and your content and your experiences and your services can meet those consumers where they want I think that's a new imperative. So if I look at like OTT, which is a big subject of discussion this year at the conference, 
We're doing things like building the video grid architecture. In fact, we're working with Charlie and his team on this. Fastest, most uh, price performance video appliance in the world. And we can do video on demand, SVOD, OTT, we can do transcoding. And once we're managing all that file, we can do it in a cloud-based architecture, whether it's on your premise or whether it's in a, in a public cloud environment, we can orchestrate that workflow using that workflow orchestration capability I was talking about. So part of the challenge for us has been to leverage all that R&D, bring it into this industry, but make it light so that this industry could take advantage of it. And that's exactly what we're doing. And I think that helps customers in this, or, or, or buyers, uh, media firms in this industry keep pace. Because if, you're, if, you're, if your R&D will is turning slower than the market is, you're in a going out of business strategy. So we had to, we had to figure out how to tap into that, that spin. Thanks, Steve. I, Steve, I, I came to IBC in its early days yet, of course, expecting everything to be about UHD and higher resolution. But actually, I find that increasingly analytics are becoming mainstream. Uh, and you must be very much involved in, in that side of it. Yeah, we, we've bought some $20 billion of companies over the last six years, most of them in the analytics area. My personal opinion is data is moving to the center of the media industry. And the reason it's so important is if you think about the new disruptors in the industry, whether it's Netflix or Amazon or Facebook or Google or anyone else, the reality is they have a business model that has data that sits at the center of their business. And they use that to their advantage, whether it's in advertising optimization, whether that's in packaging new services and products, whether that's in understanding audiences better. So what we're doing with broadcasters and media companies now is we're integrating those kind of analytics into this core platform, whether that's entity analytics around who your customer base is, or it's real-time analytics so you can sense and respond what's happening in your networks in real time, or whether it's that optimization to make sure you're doing things like optimizing your ad inventory over not just linear, but over digital, et cetera. So yeah, I agree mm -hmm. completely that the biggest single challenge facing the media industry today is it's an industry that's not historically deeply based on data and audience insight. And now that consumers are connected through networks to media companies, the ability to capture, manage, uh, and get value out of this avalanche of data that's now available is going to be a key competitive advantage. Thanks. Thanks very much. John, let me turn to you. And um, you're more at the, well, in a number of areas, but including the video consumption side of things. And uh, again, one of my observations is that a lot of the cynicism about the internet, for example, has gone out this year compared to previous years. People are sort of trying to hold back the tide, but actually um, there's a, a, a greater acceptance. But tell us a little bit about video consumption and how those changes are sort of affecting the technology ecosystem. Well, I think it's um, it's on two fronts. I think the, the the challenge is one there's commercial complexities that are introduced, uh, and then there's the the technical ones. I know you've, mm. you've you've covered a lot of the on the technology side, um, and I think um, on the technology side, um, IT went through this transformation um, really probably about 10, 15 years ago, where um, uh, the introduction of uh, networking, APIs, uh, componentization meant that the IT industry could actually uh, become more like other uh, established industries. So if you take the automotive industry, uh, Ford, Ford Motor Company, when, they, when Henry Ford famously introduced the Model T, uh, Ford manufactured everything. They, they, built the, they, they imported rubber to make tires, steel to make the, the chassis and the, the, the body parts. They basically uh, manufactured the entire car. Uh, and software was like that. I actually worked at IBM as a software engineer. It was my first job out of, uh, when graduating from university. And IBM built massive software products, uh, but they built the whole thing. Uh, and they ran on big machines as well. Um, but today, if you fast forward to the, the software industry today, it's a bit like Ford. And Ford doesn't manufacture cars anymore. Um, Ford designs cars, and then they assemble components. And those components come from many third parties. And I think the software industry has, has managed to get there too with, with, with cloud uh, and with open APIs and with mobile devices, mobile networks, broadband. Um, if you're building an application, um, you design it, and then you assemble it from components. And those components live on uh, third-party uh, cloud services, and you issue standard, uh, standards-based APIs to access them. So it's much more, you can rapidly build applications, 
You can unplug something and plug something new in when there are new things that emerge. And I think that's the, the, the benefit that uh, IT brings to, to broadcast on the, the technical side of things. Uh, also on the technical side of things, there's the distribution uh, need. So the internet was never designed um, to, to deliver video at scale and in high quality. Uh, 4K, 8K, these are terrifying uh, for, for people that know how the internet works today. And that's some of the challenge that, uh, that Akamai takes on board. That's really where we focus. That's the piece that we, we focus on addressing. Uh, and really making, it, making uh, advances in using different, different protocols, um, pre-positioning content, content, looking at using uh, multicast as, as people are looking to introduce uh, linear services now in addition to the uh, VOD services that first came online. So, so that's another area of complexity. But uh, perhaps the biggest challenge is on the, the, the uh, commercial side. So it's, there's no question that, uh, that people are turning more to, to viewing online. My daughter's just gone off to university, and on her list of things to take, um, there was a TV. You know, so there was bed linen, towels, mm. toothbrush, TV. And she said, I, what do I need my TV? I don't, I don't need a TV. I've got my laptop. So uh, the millennials, uh, that's their, their pre preferred way of uh, viewing content. Uh, us older generation, we still like the comfort of our TV. And, and I think um, the OTT debate that's, that's going on, it started in the US. I think the homogenous geography in the US makes it a, a more palatable, palatable, palatable prospect for, for many companies. Our fragmentation across Europe makes it more challenging. But nevertheless, it, it's coming, uh, coming along. I think the key challenges on the uh, commercial side is the rights, uh, how to uh, deal with the rights issues. Um, I know there was the, the famous one recently when Verizon tried to unbundle and actually distribute some of the ESPN content in a different way, o OTT. Uh, their rights pack, the, the rights agreements didn't cover that. And so there are, there are complexities and challenges and rights issues. But they did it anyway. They did it anyway, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But I think that's, that's you know, the commercial side of things, how to monetize, how to, to realize the revenue potential as, as content moves more online and the, the rights uh, behind that. And, and companies actually going online first, like Netflix with their uh, actually commissioning content, they don't have to do uh, a broker rights agreements internationally. They can just you know, decide to put it online and distribute it wherever they have um, capability to, to distribute. So a lot of transformation on the, on the commercial side yep. too. One of the questions that comes up, you mentioned your daughter, as they grow up, will they adopt the kind of attitudes that we have as a different generation? My daughter's 29 and she still doesn't have a television. So. Um, but, John, again, going back a few years, um, we would have heard at IBC a lot of people saying the internet's not fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, as you mentioned, we, we see internet being the innovator in a way, because I always associate digital with conventional broadcasters. I, can, I associate high definition with pay TV. Now, because of Netflix, we're starting to associate UHD with the internet. So is the internet now fit for purpose? Um, it's, it is fit for purpose for the usage of today. Um, yeah. I think if, we were, if, if, if the entire population was to decide that uh, when they came home from work, they were going to watch linear programming in HD, um, you know, that would cause a, a serious problem. There would be a, a massive meltdown. So um, it, it, there are steps that need to be taken. As I said, it's, it's not um, a, a challenge almost that you can just throw hardware at either. Um, it's, it's, it's taking a lot of innovation. A lot of things that Akamai is, is doing is to, to, to address this challenge of, of providing video quality at scale. Um, it is the, the paramount challenge for the internet. Uh, it will hold back um, the emergence of, of OTT and, and other uh, technology um, innovations around video online if that, that challenge can't be, uh, be, be addressed. But it's certainly it's a, it's a major focus of, of the company that I work for. Uh, and we're making very, very good progress. We work with most of the major broadcasters around the world for, for the major live events of today that, that have a, la a, li a large audience online, like the World Cups, uh, the Olympics. These are major events that we work with our broadcast partners to make sure that their OTT services work and work at high, high quality too. And we are seeing some broadcasters and content creators putting some of their content online, even sort of linear channels online, um, some of the second tier channels perhaps, but they're going online first. So thanks. By the way, if anyone wants to chip in on any of these subjects, feel, feel free. But in the short term, Tony, um, 
I guess for you, IP and the cloud. Um, how's the, we've touched upon the cloud, but expand a bit on those areas in terms of uh, broadcast networks. Well, we saw one of the um, key desires was people being able to um, run different software applications in the same environment. And that was one of the studies that said interoperability is going to be very high. And certainly, you know, Microsoft aside, we've done a lot with, with Salesforce and Oracle, <coughs> IBM DB2 mm -hmm. and others to run all of that in our clouds so that there's a lot of interoperability. But from an investment standpoint as a broadcaster, I think the biggest challenge is how quickly is this change going to come about? Mm -hmm. uh, typically, technologies get adopted in uh, one of two ways. One, faster than we all think they will, or much slower, like flying cars, never. You know, it's that, that's the sort of curve we're in. And the question today with the IP changeover from analog to uh, IP in the shop itself from baseband, how quickly is that going to happen? I'll just give you a couple of examples of uh, customers who've come to us to help facilitate that. One was uh, Fuji TV in Japan was finding that their uh, customer base was aging one year per year. That's actually not a very good sign for staying in business for a long time. Um, and for them, the necessity of going to a, a cloud-based internet uh, delivery system was primarily to gain the millennial as an audience because they weren't, as you say, having televisions. They weren't watching off cable, off satellite. In just, uh, they actually came to us and in two months were able to put this all together. Um, in, in a kind of technology we're actually demonstrating with Imagine uh, while we're here, which is putting up uh, fast uh, new pop-up channels or disaster recovery channels. We were able to put that up and their average subscriber age dropped 15 years in three months. So they were accessing an entirely new audience without making any investment in new technology. Their investment was in an ongoing cost of producing that via the cloud. Another customer based here in, in the Netherlands, Next Generation Sports Network, uh, they're, they're a funny little company. I think they're five or ten people. They bought the rights to a ton of um, soccer leagues, football leagues, outside the U.S. and not Premier League and not Bundesliga and mm -hmm. a few others. And they built a business streaming that into a new audience in the United States. But they did it without having a studio, without having... Um, I mean, they're venture capitalists who bought rights, hired us to stream it, hired someone else to do the commentary, someone else to do the collections. That kind of threat for broadcasters today is very real because if five to ten people can do an entirely new network like that, what does that mean to those of us in the broadcast industry who carry along a lot of baggage, sure. a lot of old investment? So the question is how quickly can one write that off? Will we be at the, you know, are we at the hockey stick curve right now where it's going to be so substantial that it's overtaken. And we're certainly making the bets, like I think most of the people on the panel are, that this is going to come very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, Charlie, you're converting commu Imagine Communications from, to, to an IP bet. And I think what, you know, what, uh, what Steve and John and, and, and Marilyn and Lionel are doing is, is all looking at how quickly is this going to come, how can we be there at the right time. Uh, and we're certainly making investments to do that. Just to pick up on Go a point yep. Tony made, one uh, suggestion I might make is take a look at some of the other segments of the industry beyond broadcasting too, because there's a lot of innovative things happening. So uh, his Fuji example reminded me of, of a project we just did in Japan over the course of last year where we, we built a mobile gaming cloud, uh, cloud because uh, it's the hottest mobile gaming marketplace in the world. There, there are companies in Japan today that can go from zero to $100 million a month in six weeks' time. And so you can think about the complexity of onboarding all those new mm. customers, uh, scaling your platforms, handling all those transactions. The only way to do that is to use cloud architectures in order to mm. do that. And, and it, it provides, um, we had a similar experience, uh, we partnered with Turner when they uh, decided to license the rights to the Academy Awards this last year and wanted to launch it in Latin America. It didn't exist. In a matter of a couple of weeks time, we were able to put that platform up and create a whole new service for them in a marketplace that they didn't have the rights for just a few months earlier. So I, I think these are very important points because it's the, the leverage of some of these technologies can allow you to move much, much quicker. Thanks, Lee. 
I get the impression that predicting the future, where we're going to be, is actually impossible. So it puts us in the realms of experimentation. We, we, we have to experiment. So is it um, sort of about being able to put something together quickly, inexpensively, scale it up rapidly if, if it's a success, but maybe turn it off if it's not? Is there an element of that in driving what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I think the, the worst example that all of us can think of is not one where we spin up a service and uh, people don't come to watch and you turn it off. Okay, not a big expense. The mm. worst example is when you spin up a service and millions of people come to watch and you can't <laughs> deliver it. You can't serve Scale. it. Yeah. You get the worst black eye in the world. Yeah. So we're, we're all about creating the amount of, uh, you know, we're investing more than five billion a year in what we do in the cloud. Not R&D investment overall at Microsoft, it's far above that. And that is around 21, it's probably by now 23, uh, Azure data centers around the world to service customers. And, and we're not the only ones doing it. Obviously Amazon and, and Google and uh, IBM and uh, HP are also investing in that type of scale to be ready for that. You don't know what it's going to be because video streaming and video storage is certainly a great consumer, I'm happy to say, of, of cloud resources. But we also do the voting for uh, the American Idol type program in Hong Kong, which is a great example of something that happens for 20 minutes once a week. You don't need a data center to do that. You only need it for 20 mm. minutes. So that kind of capacity, I think, has got to be out there. Sure. Th thanks very much, uh, Tony. Lionel. Uh, this is a subject very close to the IABM's heart. It's, it's about skills. Um, we, we have this continuous discussion, and I think it's a little bit of an old one, but it's saying that traditional broadcast engineers don't understand IT, IT engineers don't understand broadcast. But I know you want to talk about training and skills. That, that's where you're coming from. So Lionel, take it away. Well, I don't know if that's where I'm coming from, but I certainly had to do a lot of adaptation yeah. myself. Um, I started my career uh, actually as a software engineer uh, by some accident, and I, I fell in love with software. And uh, I've spent most of my uh, work career on it. And um, it's interesting what you say. So I was watching the charts earlier when uh, Peter was uh, yeah. showing the industry survey. And the charts, one of the things that struck me is the charts said the number one factor that's getting uh, delivery is skills. And it's uh, because of what you say, right? Uh, in what do you need to take um, television or broadcast and uh, turn it into the new style of uh, video, the new style mm -hmm. of TV? Uh, adapt to the consumption, uh, mm -hmm. change the production, uh, change the business models. Uh, you need to mix uh, the skills of how you produce and how do you distribute mm -hmm. and how you manage audiences and, uh, and commercialize that uh, with the skills of uh, how you use IT for that mm -hmm. because this uh, multi-purpose IT technology and networking um, has become actually um, a better way of mm -hmm. doing things and uh, with different ways of doing it, with equipment, with uh, uh, cloud services. Oh. And you need to mix and match all of this to your situation. Mm -hmm. So you need the skills you need fundamentally, you need to combine the uh, video skills and the IT skills. Mm -hmm. And especially on the technology side, uh, that, that's very uh, clear. So how do you do that? And um, I was uh, reflecting on what happened to us and we, uh, in media, we really started uh, about 12 years ago in 2003. Um, and uh, we went through a um, long learning curve mm. of how to uh, apply IT to media. But I was also thinking that before we did that, we actually embarked on a similar journey for telecom. And I know some of us in the room have, have some telecom background as well. And um, the, we had to do this transformation. When we started using Unix systems for uh, telecom uh, service control real time uh, back in the uh, mid 90s, uh, that was considered something dangerous, right? And uh, only people with their heads shaved in a certain way would do that. Uh, 
Mm. Uh, <laughs> now it has become, uh, it, it has evolved a lot. It has even moved to Linux and virtualization, mm. and, and all the craze now is about uh, network functions virtualization, uh, which I think is going to come to um, broadcast soon as well. Mm. And uh, so that, how did that transformation happen? By I would say by osmosis because some people uh, from IT got the video skills, some people from, uh, uh, um, sorry, the, the telecom skills in that case, mm. some people from telecom got the IT skills, and, um, and they work together. And I think it's the same that is happening in video, and it, because it's already happening. Uh, some people from IT are uh, catching enough of the video skills, and some people mm. of, of uh, video are uh, catching enough of the IT skills. Um, I think with the move, the transformation we are facing, it's about moving to fundamentally a software-defined uh, workflow. Mm. Uh, I'm saying that in a very broad sense. And uh, operating that on a um, IT infrastructure which can be virtualized cloud-based. And some of the workflows can actually be cloud services as well, which begs the question, how do you manage that? Um, how do you um, actually create a, uh, a kind of control plane Mm -hmm. uh, for uh, you as a company and um, for the broadcasters. Um, actually, how do you transform? How do you integrate both the new stuff and mm -hmm. all the legacy that is not going away anytime soon at various levels, at the uh, business process level, at the uh, technology and networking level? Um, and I think all of us are uh, working on that, actually, mm -hmm. uh, or various pieces of that. Uh, some focus on cloud. We focus a lot on... Uh, um, managing the overall workflow and on um, engineering uh, the transformation and the infrastructure that's supporting that. We focus also on the um, application of web services. Steve made a reference to it. And uh, that is a very a service oriented architecture, uh, is one of the elements of building the, the right flexibility. So it's one of those skills that, that <coughs> you need to learn because not every IT guy understands service-oriented architecture. And once you do that, you can be very flexible. For instance, if you are uh, kind of uh, permanently transforming your over-the-top front end, um, you may want to break it down into major components that you can manage independently. And one of the things we are doing is we are taking, for instance, the uh, uh, digital video recording capability, uh, network-based, and we are encapsulating that as a set of web services that you can integrate with the uh, front-end, uh, TV front-end application mm -hmm. uh, in multiple ways, and you can evolve separately. So I think that's the kind of skills that needs to be uh, right. acquired. Very interesting. And, and how would you sort of describe HP's contribution to these changes that we're making. Where where do you see HP's role in in the changes? That I are think happening? we are um, in the business. I would say in in many parts because we have infrastructure investments, mm -hmm. which are leverage for uh, the all the equipment uh, and the IT infrastructure, and the networking, the servers, the storage, mm -hmm. the cloud. Uh, we also have a uh, solution investment and partnerships, uh, including a partnership with uh, Imagine Communications, um, which is very major uh, pillar for us, mm -hmm. uh, by which we focus on uh, integrating the pieces together, making mm -hmm. them work. So the interoperability, I was also seeing that as, as a key uh, uh, concern on the charts. That is one of our areas of investment. Uh, how do you make those things interoperable? Mm -hmm. How do you manage the whole system? Right. Very good. Muriel, let me move to yourself. And uh, this is, they're all interesting. This is taking a slightly different direction because I suspect you can tell us a, from a very practical point of view of um, uh, are broadcasters really implementing IP? And I'm sorry to, I've got to add a bit of cynicism here. <laughs> Does it work? <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, of course, they are implementing IP. It's over, uh, I think, more than 10 years uh, that IP is used uh, in broadcast centers, in uh, remote production trucks, for everything related to tapeless workflow, um, file-based workflow, uh, to manage content, exchange file, and so on. So IP um, is in the broadcast industry since a, a really long time. Um, now the question is, when is it going to come in the live production mm -hmm. industry, which Absolutely. is uh, the core of the, the business of EVS? 
And here also we see that IP um, has played a role um, since a few years already when it really creates benefits being uh, either creating operational efficiencies or really open new ways of monetizing uh, new content, uh, bring, reaching a broader audience and so on. And I'll give you a, a few examples. If you think about uh, the FIFA uh, World Wide Cup mm -hmm. uh, in 2014, uh, we have implemented uh, between the 12 venues and the IBC in Rio. Um, so they were IP, uh, IP connected. And so mm -hmm. basically the production team uh, in Rio could access all the content recorded on the live pro video production mm -hmm. server uh, in the 12 venues, like thousands of miles away, access instantly the, the content, mm -hmm. reviewing that, selecting them, and then import the high resolution file for the production. So those are examples. This is one example of uh, using IP in live production. Another kind of example is uh, our Ccast uh, cloud-based mm. IP-based um, platform for distribution of content. So we started it in 2012 already with Canal Plus. It was used again in the worldwide uh, FIFA Cup. Um, and basically, it allows the user to see on their smartphone, on their tablet, so the second screen, uh, clips other multi-angle uh, of cameras that have not been uh, uh, broadcasted. So um, this is also used in the stadium that are wired. We have partnership with Cisco in that. So there are many areas, even in live production, where IP is used. But again, it's live production, but it's not yet the heart of yeah. the live production. Yeah. And so, so what's about the live of heart production? So. Here again, you see a lot of traction. Um, we had in Europe over the last months, especially, uh, seen a lot of tenders um, of uh, broadcasters that are actually extremely interested to have a full IP-based infrastructure. So we talk about in, uh, infrastructure as a service, virtualization. Um, they often they start to uh, think about new buildings, so they really wonder um, if they couldn't just cable it fully IP. So there is a lot of traction and willingness to go into that. Um, now, to be honest, there, there is still the, the issue of interoperability and maturity mm -hmm. of the ecosystem. So there is a lot of traction. Uh, there is a lot of initiatives that show that it works. Uh, I can name a few initiatives. There is one um, done by the VRT, a Belgian public broadcaster. Um, they've done it with EBU and a set of uh, vendors, and EVS is uh, very much involved. And they really demonstrated that you can uh, develop uh, an IP-based uh, studio um, that worked pretty well uh, based on, of course, open standard like SMPT 2022. So it's, mm. it's shown uh, uh, here at IBC. We have other initiatives. We have one with Imagine, where we show also that you know, thanks to the use of the open standard, again, SMPT 2022, but also mm. JPEG 2000, we can, uh, um, we can make interoperability work. We have also initiative with uh, an example of true live production with Cisco, um, with SDN networks, uh, and so on. So we really have a lot of examples that show that it works, yeah. um, but it's going to take still uh, some time uh, to, uh, uh, to, you know, to go to this t uh, transition, mm. uh, and we will spend still a few years in this hybrid mode. First, because it makes a lot of sense to protect the existing investment. Mm. And second, because we need a bit more maturity uh, in terms mm. of uh, sure. interoperability. Uh, another example I, I would like to give also, it's um, about uh, big events, mm. um, because we uh, are working now with the countries that have won the big events like Qatar, that are actually now wiring their stadium and also establishing high-speed connection between the stadium to be able to uh, implement uh, live production in IP. So we work working with them on those workflows for the years to come. Mm. Okay, that, that's fascinating. And in a way, I think it leads on, Charlie, you've been very patient. <laughs> <at the end. laughs> it leads on to, to Charlie, because um, when we first met, um, uh, you were talking about change and how you saw the, the industry changing. And um, as Muriel's mentioned, we're going through a bit of a hybrid world at the moment. So um, my question would be, is change happening as fast or slower than you expected? And how long are we going to be in this hybrid world, a mixture of technologies? Well, I think for us, you know, we, um, you know, we've stayed laser focused on where the eyeballs are. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, inherently what everybody has really talked about is uh, where are the eyeballs and how are those eyeballs uh, impacting uh, ultimately our customers? And, and I think, you know, two and a half years ago when I came into this space, um, one of the things that we spent a lot of time investing in is, you know, 
how our customers' business models were going to change. Right. And how they make money today is not necessarily how they're going to make money tomorrow. And I think that the platforms that exist today are not necessarily the platforms that are going to allow them to have the flexibility and the agility that they need uh, to generate the revenue to provide you know, the earnings profiles that ultimately they need. And so I think you got to start with the end in mind. Uh, we have made some pretty gutsy moves over the last couple of years. I mean, we've shifted 75% of our R&D spend towards IP and software-defined networking and cloud infrastructures because we feel like first market mover has its advantage. Sure. Um, you know, in the first six months of this year, we've gone from basically no trials on next generation technology to 90. Mm. So when, when you look at what we're doing with IP Playout um, and, and, and IP Playout in a virtualized cloud infrastructure, we, you know, we announced the big deal with Disney ABC uh, in April. There, there is 20 of, of those trials that are going on right now, some of which are working with, with some of the partners up here, up here on the stage. Um, we have a lot going on with, with software-defined networking. And software-defined networking really, uh, in, its, in its best practicality, is, is ultimately how you can work in this hybrid environment. There's, you know, you got 40 years of SDI baseband infrastructure that's, that's you know, installed. And, and, you know, I think if, if a lot of our large tier one customers had a magic wand and they could just, you know, they had all the CapEx dollars in the world, they would just snap their fingers and, and move to this new world. But that's not the practicality of, of how spend happens. And so, you know, oftentimes we, we talk about the evolution of next gen and how it happens, but we don't talk about the practicality of, of spend. And there's only so many dollars that our customers are, are going to spend every year in evolving their networks. And, um, and so I think trying to balance, you know, the, the, the SDI baseband world today and, and next generation IP world has a lot to do with just their ability to, to spend, you know, at our press conference yesterday, I actually talked a lot about skill sets and, you know, I saw this in the telecom world that it was the single biggest challenge is that, you know, frankly, most of the people running the networks are, um, are not 20, 30 year old kids. I mean, they're, they're people that have been in the industry a long time. And, uh, and so the skill set challenges that they have and, and their ability to adapt to the new change is, is frankly, I think one of the single biggest challenges. I think it's why, um, you know, a lot of the panelists that are up here are going to be adding a tremendous amount of value in their ability to offload a lot of uh, those skill set challenges into this next generation world as it moves into a virtualized cloud environment, uh, taking advantage of, uh, of all the opportunity and challenges that IP brings. Uh, I've been on plenty of panels talking about IP and the benefits of IP. Uh, there's certainly challenges with IP and, and I think the single biggest you know, opportunity and challenge that we all have in this room is, is working together. I mean, I've, I've tried to be one of those catalysts in, in our industry to create an ecosystem that even though Grass Valley and, and Imagine might compete, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is companies like us have to get on the same page. How's that progressing? Because I remember one of the first speeches you gave was <laughs> a, a call for collaboration. Well, I mean, you, you heard it from just, yeah, yeah. you know, a few people yeah. up on stage. I mean, we, we you know, I, I sort of come from the, the philosophy that I, I'd rather compete on technology than compete on architecture. Hmm. And so this is an industry that not, that, that not has historically you know, worked very well in a collaborative manner. It, it's an industry that, that, you know, we talk about snowflakes and how many different ways networks are being built and there's so many different proprietary technologies that can deliver the same solution. And, and that worked in, in, in the world that, you know, broadcast existed for years. But as you move to this next generation environment, it won't work. And we've got to get to standards that this industry will embrace. And I think it's going to take some of the larger companies Mm. To, to frankly come together and say this is, you know, the path that we're going to take for the betterment of our end user customers. And, um, and so, you know, that's, that's what we've been doing. And, um, you know, there's, there's no secret sauce in, in, mm. in Imagine strategy. We're, we're, we're pretty open and, uh, and transparent about what we're trying to do. And, um, you know, we, we realize that we're not going to be everything to everyone, but I think that 
um, the investments that we're making, uh, we certainly believe that it's going to give us uh, an opportunity to participate as, as the market evolves. And you clearly see collaboration as good for business ultimately. Absolutely. Yeah. John, I just interject. One of the things that technology companies have continuously had to go through is this transformation. Mm -hmm. this, the, the, our, our products just, they don't have the life cycle of what a broadcaster has had in the past. Yeah. Um, and if it's, um, you know, like ourselves saying, okay, we'll run Salesforce because that's what our customers run, or just the other day, we're going to partner with VMware, which I thought would, you know, it's like hell freezing over. Um, but it's that kind of thing that customer demand is, yeah. is bringing about. So each one of us has gone through that kind of transformation. I think we have some good examples for the industry of how to make it happen without dying in the process mm -hmm. uh, because that, that's not in any of our interests. And um, if, if, we can, you know, if we can envision the day when there that is that IP world, which is you know lighting up a new channel with a few strokes on a keypad or, yeah. or something else, I think that'll happen. Well, we're doing it. I mean, yeah. you know, the the one thing that we talk a lot about, and I think you know, uh, the companies who are looking at ways in which they can move play out automation into a virtualized environment, you know, I think there's a misnomer that. Um, IP and, and, and a lot of the next generation services equals operational cost savings. It, it's really not why our customers are moving in that direction. They're moving in that direction because they're trying to find innovative ways to generate more growth and, and more revenue. And in the case of Disney, I mean, we are right now, you know, working with them uh, to be able to develop, uh, to be able to launch pop-up channels in like, you know, minutes and hours. And, and you know, one of the things that, that wasn't really talked about that I've learned over the last couple of years <clears throat> that uh, that I think is is kind of a, a new nuance to all this new technology is is the fact that there's so many things that our customers can't do mm. because they can't afford to do it. Meaning that it takes a year to to, to develop a, 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 an architecture to develop a, and launch a channel today. So there's a lot of business plans that never even get implemented. There's lots of great ideas, but they never even get implemented because they can't afford to test it. Yeah. Well, as you move to a world where you can virtualize, um, you know, a, a network to where you know you can you can actually test a new channel in a in a in a very inexpensive way, uh, it's going to create uh, a lot more you know flexibility and, and it's going to create a lot more creativity. I think um, upon the the network creators mm -hmm. of content to where they can launch new channels, they can test them for a period of time. They're not spending ten, twenty, thirty million dollars to launch that channel. They're, they're turning up you know, more servers and more storage that's in a virtualized network architecture that allow them to, uh, to do that. And, and I think that that ultimately is what's going to give our customers an opportunity to compete in a world that's changing pretty fast. I mean, our customers are, are embedded with a, a, a lot of legacy and, and that's their single biggest challenge. The, the next generation OTT players don't have that. And so, they also don't have a lot of the benefits that a lot of our traditional broadcast media customers have either. And so our goal is to make sure that, you know, we're giving our traditional customers the ability to um, participate like a next gen uh, and launch new services like a next gen and, and do it in a very effective and, and uh, economical way. I was going to say it kind of brings it full circle because mm -hmm. um, a company like uh, an ABC who's implemented the kind of flexible architecture we talked about earlier that abstracts their services, and those services can execute in a cloud environment, it, and it, it gives them the ability then to actually integrate an open platform with a, a lot of partners like Imagine in order to move quickly in those markets. That's why I think moving in this direction is so important because no one can predict the future, but if you have the agility to move in the direction you need to, to launch services for wherever they should launch based on latency or other demands, mm -hmm then you have, you have the ability to incorporate those new technologies. Yeah. I think it's important for you guys to, to show some successful case studies because I suspect Peter talked about a bit of a slowdown in the business. People are not investing in traditional infrastructures and they're waiting to hear more successful case studies, I think, to, to move their... But there's a lot of activity. I mean, yeah, just, we're just one company. I mean, you know, I'm sure there's a, a lot of you know, uh, similar activities from, from companies in the room here. But I, I think that there's a lot more activity than people think. And, and because there hasn't been a lot of public announcements, yeah. uh, you're not seeing it. But, uh, you know, 
I expect that over the next six to nine months, you're going to see a, a, a pretty significant movement. Let's see if, we, excuse me, let me see if we've covered the, because we get time is going, let's see if we've covered the items that our audience wants. If there are no questions, I'll come back to you guys. But George, there's a question here at the front. Um, the, all the great stuff about interoperability is wonderful because we're all fighting off the proprietary side. Uh, one of the little ghosts as you walk around this show are all the comments about HEVC advance versus the Alliance for Open Media. Um, is this the Roundheads versus the Royalists? Is it LA, uh, MPEG LA revisited? Um, is it just another um, nightmare we've got to resolve? And which two of these are going to win? So anyone have a view on that? It's a little bit off well, topic. Well, basically, it's because um, the Alliance for Open Media did respond to HEVC advance, and the industry is based on HEVC. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're certainly supporting HEBC. Um, yeah. So we're, we're making a pretty significant investment there. Yeah. And, and we're a member of the Alliance for Open Media because we believe there needs to be a open um, codec that people can implement. And so we'll, you know, I, I don't want to say we're going to support both. We're working on both at the same time. Mm -hmm. so. Our, our strategy has been kind of more general answer to that question. Our strategy has been along the lines that we've been talking as IT finds its way more into the center of the media industry is uh, we routinely now, uh, when, we, when we do something that we think is very innovative and can help the industry at large move forward, we open source it because we want all the other providers in the marketplace to embrace that so that we can accelerate the change in, in the industry. So I think you'll see those kinds of moves happening more and more. Mm. Certainly on Peter's graphs, interoperability was still up there. People still want to be able to choose best of breed amongst you guys and, and make them work. Question over the far side. Hi, uh, Fintan McKernan from Ideal Systems in Singapore. Um, a question that our customers ask us, uh, we build broadcast facilities all over Asia. Um, and having built uh, and still building SDI broadcast facilities, uh, when is the cost of building a broadcast facility in IP going to be cheaper than building the cost of a broadcast facility in baseband? And is it a question of cheaper, or is it you know, the ability to do more with the same amount of investment? I mean, look, we... I don't... We, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Mm. Well, I, I don't know that the exact answer is one or the other at this moment in time. Um, I think sports came up a couple times today. I'll just give you a quick example. You know, we, do, we still do Wimbledon, the U.S. Open, Ryder Cup, the Masters, et cetera. In fact, we're just finishing the U.S. Open this, this week. And, uh, you know, the traditional broadcast uh, partner uh, for, for something like the U.S. Open will give a linear experience and, and do it in a first-rate manner. Um, we do all the over-the-top where we provide, you know, tablet, PC, mobile, uh, but the difference is in the kind of personalized view that that consumer over the top can get. They can pick the court they want to watch. They can dive into the analytics when they want to dive into it. They can share it in social media if they want to share it in social media. And the, to me, the important point is we can take a finite amount of data, a tremendous amount of data, but a finite amount of data, and we can create an infinite number of experiences. So. To me, I don't know that it's necessarily the question is one or the other at this point in time, but how do they work together to create a more compelling set of offerings for, for mm -hmm. the marketplace? You know, we worked I, with I, would, I would tell you there's, that you know, just because we're, we're doing it, it there's, there's two things. One is you know, if you look at the really large conglomerate broadcasters uh, that have lots of affiliates, uh, you know, instead of building out 200, you know, uh, affiliate broadcast locations, you're building out 8 to 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you're spending a lot less money in fewer locations that, you know, you, you know, from an operation standpoint, you're able to, you know, create a, you know, 8 to 10 master control centers instead of creating a lot of uh, that technology in a lot of different locations. And I think the smaller broadcaster ultimately is going to find that uh, being able to, uh, virtualize some part or all of their network functions uh, in a in a cloud environment is going to be a lot more flexible for them uh, in their ability to uh, uh, to to more financially compete in in uh, in the next generation world. If I can add something on that, I think it depends really on, on different factors, so you can't give a, a clear answer because indeed if you go to IP, um, first you have less, you know, the cost of the cabling, the, 
the components that are cut and so on uh, that can give you saving, but you need to have the high speed connection, um, you know, if you want to have uh, multiple locations. So it depends on, on the cost of the operators to give you those uh, access to those fibers. Um, so you have, um, you know, you have different elements to take into account. You can, you, you can have uh, some production teams working remotely from home. So you might say that you are uh, uh, saving on the size of the broadcast facility uh, and depending on, on the price of the meter square in Singapore, it might be quite high. It, might, it can be interesting. So I think the equation um, has really a lot of factors. And so giving a, a pure answers with a date or a figure really depends on the situation. How is it used? Is it going to be remote, um, et cetera, et cetera, and the whole setup? Lionel, I think you, you would. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to want overwhelm to. the audience, but I, I think it really depends what you want to do. And in the projects I see, uh, the question is not framed that way. The question is, what do you want to achieve? <laughs> And yeah. the answer is, um, in the, at least in the projects we see, because we don't see classic broadcast projects at all, um, you've got to use IP because that's what's giving you the agility you need. Mm. I, I guess in times past, there's always a struggle with answering those questions because you're not replacing the same functions that you did before. You're putting in some of these new systems because you want to do things fundamentally differently. And uh, so to say, to compare one with the other is, is very diff difficult because they're not, they're not a direct re replacement one for the other. Josh, I think at the front there, has got a question. Yeah, I, I, I suspect I can project pretty well. <laughs> uh, just uh, Josh Steinhoff from Devonprov. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I know there's been a lot of technology questions, but I had a, a business question. It's probably most appropriate for Charlie and, and uh, uh, in Mural, if I said that correctly. Um, Charlie, you've been both consistent and early, going back two and a half years since you joined the industry, just on the technology component. But I'm curious, as we move to ITIP, how close do you think we are to getting those type of pricing models in the industry? So support rates more consistent, you know, 16, 18, 20 percent, whereas they're currently substantially lower than that? Yeah, I, th I think it's a really good question in, in the sense that, you know, if there's one area that we're struggling is uh, the commercial models right now because we are kind of paving the way uh, right now. I mean, we, you know, we have, you know, PaaS models today, we have SaaS models today, and we have uh, infrastructure as a service models today. And, and because there's not a cheat sheet that, that's out there, um, you know, we're we're sort of uh, we're sort of navigating in a in a in a in sort of a new space and and trying to create you know what that new pricing model is going to look like. Um, you know, in the case of of, of Disney ABC, they they certainly um, have helped us with some yeses and nos uh, through the process. Um, yeah. And and we're and you know we we've got the one thing I will tell you is you know we've got projects going on almost in every region. And every region uh, has a different uh, sort of approach and, and appetite for uh, the, the new pricing models. And, and I do think that to the question that was asked earlier, I, I do think, I, I, you know, I want to be careful saying this because I know that there's a few uh, of our customers in the room. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but the, the reality is, is, you know, in the early goings, customers are probably going to spend more money in the early goings, just like we are. I mean, I'm spending more money today because I'm having to spend R&D dollars to support our existing traditional products as well as having to spend money on all this next gen before it comes. And, uh, and I think customers who are smart and understand uh, and have gone through all these ebbs and flows of how transitions happen are probably going to have to spend a little bit more money in the early goings because they're going to have to support their existing network while they're building this next generation network, i.e. this hybrid network. Uh, but they're doing it because they ultimately see that they're going to be able to generate more revenue and, and have a more flexible business model in the long term. Muriel, I have to give the last word to you because time's getting on. I think you want to come um, back on that. Yes, indeed, we are. You know, we hear our customers who want to have much more flexibility also uh, in pricing. So we are considering and, and thinking uh, also about way to bring uh, more flexibility. Um, and also, we are. You know, we have when we have introduced things like Sika's um, multi distribution platform, which is completely different from you know, setting a, a box of a server or a workflow. Um, there are indeed naturally some new models. That that, uh, that are, are put on the table, like revenue sharing uh, uh, with new monetization of new content and so on. So uh, there is a lot of completely different things that are uh, happening now. Thank you, Mior. Well, I'm afraid we'll probably have to close it there. And I think the discussion this morning has 
very nicely set the scene and the agenda, at least for part of the discussion at IBC. And I guess IBC will, the exhibition side will be open for business shortly. We are in a period of change, obviously. Um, for end users, it means going about work in a very different way, um, not only operational practices, but spend, whether it's in capital spend or services. They still need to invest to make it happen. And I guess if we get it right, it's a tremendous opportunity for companies with the right products and the right services. Um, hopefully today's given a few pointers um, to help identify the opportunities that are there. So most importantly, please thank the panelists and Peter for their fascinating insights. And once again, thank you for so many people turning out so early in the morning. It's the beginning of IBC. I really hope you have a, a great week. Thank you.